So, um, yeah, getting this thing started, how would you describe what exactly it is that you do or what you talk about on your channel? So I would just, so one of my students asked me, he's like, what would you call this knowledge? And I call it the knowledge of freedom. Cause a lot mm. of people, they get scared of this stuff because they, they think that this knowledge is going to make them want to renounce the world or, but actually it just frees you from the world mentally, but physically you're still here. And a lot of people think it's like, oh, I'm learning spiritual knowledge or I'm learning this or that. But really, it's an unlearning. Like a man mm. approached uh, Sage Ramana Maharshi and he was like a scholar. And he asked Ramana, he was like, I, I'm here to learn. And Ramana said, well, you're going to have to leave because here we unlearn. And I always remind people that I'm not teaching anything new. It's just I'm a different expression of it. And basically, Sage Ramana, Buddha, many people have taught this knowledge of freedom for thousands of years. and I'm just like, I'm so excited. Like ever since, you know, I got enlightened, it's just like this burning fire to like share this wisdom and like this knowledge of freedom and this transcendental wisdom that I, I think it, 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 and nothing else is more valuable than this because mm. everything else comes after this, literally, quite exactly. literally. Exactly. I like to say the Dharma is primary and everything else is secondary. Because it, 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 yeah, it, like you, it, it leads to, it leads to every, the secondary, like it has to, it's like yeah. backwards not to. All roads lead to the Dharma. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, well said, man. Um, so how would you describe what we're trying to unlearn? Like, what are we trying to, you know, peel back to see in this uh, in this path to liberation? You're trying to peel back you. It's like the mind has to be killed because this idea of you, it's such a nuisance. It's It restricts you. It's like it's so insulting to the true you. People don't realize how insulting identifying with their mind is to their true being. It, it it's like <laughs> it, it's like spitting in your own face and and giving away your power at all times. But when you realize you're a pure being, it's like you realize like how much of a fool you've been, like how much you have thought you've known, think you thought you've known, think think of that. so many times how you got caught up in your own mind, created your own hell, created your own even your own heaven sometimes, which it wasn't even heaven in reality. You know, it's like instead of just being. It's like we want to get caught up in this mind. It's, it's crazy how sneaky the mind is, too. Mm -hmm. It like creeps up, you know, it, it it like so the basically that's why meditation and sadhana is so important because it's like scrubbing the mind. It's like we have to scrub the mind. It's like we, it, we know it's a clean mirror. We know it's already perfect. Nirvana is always there because it wouldn't have been worth anything if it wasn't always there. But we have to scrub the mind because the mind's in this way. And then you realize it was never actually. That's the funniest part to me is that the mind wasn't even real in the first place. That's the mind. <laughs> that's hilarious. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Right. We build up the illusion ourselves. Like we, we created this whole illusion. <laughs> Literally and forget, forgot about it. Yeah. God forgets himself. Yeah. And that's the thing. Yeah. We forgot about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would you say this whole path is a path of remembrance? Like coming back home type of thing? Yes. Coming back home to Godhood. Yeah. Remembering your godhood, mm -hmm. going yeah. beyond the mind. Mm. Yeah. Oh. So you mean the mind as in the idea of identification of I'm just Gary, right? Yes. Yeah. I am this or I am that. That's insulting. That, that's <laughs> insulting. Restrictive. I've never that's heard anybody handcuffs. describe it like that. It's insulting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a smack in the face to the truth. Because you're God. So to, to identify <laughs> yeah, with the mind, it's like, wow, like, what are yeah. you doing? Yeah, that's so true, man. I love your delivery. You're just so upfront, but it is, that's the truth. It's, it's really, it's really that succinct and that simple. You're God. Like, come on, <laughs> like smarten up. <laughs> wise like, up. Yeah. Why, why is that? <laughs> Cause yeah. it's like, I, I can't, I mean, not that I can't stand suffering, but just, I want to communicate how, just to use words about how much I want people to be free. It's like, when you know that the bliss that exists there, the mm. freedom that exists there, like that no matter what, and you've read sages that have been through like such tumultuous like experiences and you've been through the experiences yourself and you know where this stuff can lead. It's like you want to get it to people as much as possible. This, this, yeah. this, this, this going beyond the mind because it's like Zen. It's oh my God. It's like so it's crazy how powerful Zen is. It's like. Mm hmm. It's mm -hmm. like this because it's like it's like I was saying before, it's hilarious how much of a burden this mind is until it isn't. It's like, mm -hmm. what the hell? Like, it's mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah, I'm in love with this, like the, this, this, this truth. Like, you can tell, man, I can sense the passion. I feel that. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that fire and that um, 
that just energy that comes forth, like a different kind of will that comes about in living. True purpose, you know, like true purpose. Purpose as past the a paycheck or status or trying to accumulate material good. Like true purpose in this experience as a human is um is the Dharma, like I said. And um yeah, I I it's um how do I put this? It's invaluable. Like that that purpose, that invaluableness of being able to know the dharma read the dharma from sages past and but also being able to transmit it in a way that others can relate to what more do you need what more do you want you know like that's it that's that's life man um at least for me and i think for you as well but that's the thing is i think once you once you kind of get attuned to dharmic teachings from sages past I feel, and maybe you can attest to this, there is a certain feeling of obligation, but it's obligation with no strings attached, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like I need to talk about this. That's why I have this podcast where I come on here and talk to people, because if I didn't, that would actually cause me more suffering if I didn't talk about it, you know? Do you feel that there there is an obligation in just in, in your life to have to talk about this? I'm so, I'm so glad you brought this up because like I love talking about surrender and mm. this is why the illusion of free will is a lie because you know people they they wonder okay am I going to be a renunciate where I don't even want to talk to the world if I get enlightened or but like you just said it's like the it's not your choice it's like no, yeah. no man can remain completely still so the universe you're going to the universe is going to live your purpose through you if, if either it wants you to be the worst man in the world or it wants you to be a person who spreads knowledge about wisdom, it's not going to let you just do nothing. You know, it's like yeah. the, the, the thoughts come to your mind and you act on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like the illusion of, of choice is, is hilarious. And it's like, like, I, I agree with it. It definitely is an obligation because the God we're going to do what the goddess wants, whether she likes we like it or not. Mm -hmm. Like Siddhar Meswar said, you know, when people, when things go bad, people lose faith, but let God do what he likes. Not have faith that it's going to be good, but just have faith that God is going to do whatever he likes. <laughs> That's peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Peace is true surrender to God. It's that simple. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. How did you come to find that God exists, man? We live in an atheistic world, an atheistic society. So saying this and having this conversation is blasphemy to the, the atheistic mindset. So how did you come to find that? It's 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 funny, actually. It, atheists, they, they don't realize that they actually kind of agree with me in a way. I don't, mm. you know, I don't have a, a, I think this this nothingness that we speak of, it's just words to describe. It's not zero, it's just zero. It's, it's plenty full. It just is not any particular thing, this God. Yeah. So atheists, they don't realize that if they're in love with the science of things, but it aligns with the God too. It's just they're uh -huh. so scared of the Christian version because they've been yeah. traumatized and it's been force fed that they don't realize that they're, people ask, uh, where is God? I say, where is he not? You know, they're asking <laughs> it the wrong way. It's, mm -hmm. He's definitely everywhere. Yeah. And speaking right now, look at this miracle. Look at this. Like, what is this? This is... This is a miracle. Like. Yeah, exactly. Where is he not? I like that a lot because I used to, I, I went through an atheistic phase in my younger years. I was like, there's like, how could there be, a God? it doesn't make any sense. You know, like you said, where is he? Where is this God? How could there be a God in such a dark world? Um, I guess it just, it's a perspective shift and you have to see that God is everything. Where is he not? You're right. Um, yeah, that's so powerful, man. It's like, um, yeah, like, how do you see that? Like, how do you, that's the thing is like, how do you get to that? Or how did you specifically get to that perspective of being able to see literally the guru and everything, see God in all of the light and the darkness? Like, how did this come into your being? This is, and this is why I say devotion is so important because you have to, a lot of people in the West, they miss out on surrendering to the guru. But this man is, it has come before you. These sages have come before you and you have to trust that they will lead you to where they are. That's mm -hmm. why one of my favorite uh, gurus, Siddhar Meswar, he says, or Nisugadarta, he says, if my words pierce somebody, he, he will be called a Siddha. And basically he's saying that no matter what, you if you listen to the sages, you will be wise. And mm -hmm. that, it's like, I trusted them so much. And mm -hmm. I read their, like every, like I had, nothing was worth 
more to me than like freedom. Like you have to put devotion. You have to be devoted to freedom, devoted to the guru. Like you said, seeing the guru and everything you have, you, you have to listen. Like, it, you know, it's like, and this is, and it's like, this is, people are scared of like authority or spiritual authorities, but they're not, the only things they're going to tell you is not things that are going to imprison you, but everything they tell you is going to free you. If you listen, all you have to yeah. do is listen to the sages. It's so, mm -hmm. but you have like, it's like, you, you have to put it before. And a lot, it's not just listening. Like, it's like really like embodying it. Like you have to promise yourself like, okay, when I wake up, Osho said, when you wake up, don't just let your mind rush into your thoughts. Okay, when I wake up, I ha I have to listen to this man. This man isn't laying, I have to, but a lot of people, don't, they don't actually trust the gurus. They don't mm -hmm. actually believe they can get them to where they want, they want them to go. Yeah. And it's like a lot of people, they want to do everything by themselves. But these, like I said before, these guys have done it already. Why waste, why waste the time trying to be all entrepreneur with spirituality you know mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't... yeah i know what you mean man um that's interesting because i revere realized being so greatly and i also realize man <laughs> yeah i guess so uh but i also realize that living in this time is such a miracle as well the fact that we have these guys to reference that have made it per se and we have all of their teachings to reference literally in our pocket like that it's like can, yeah, it, it's like insane. Like you would have to go like scrolls in a temple and stuff. Like it, yeah, it's right. Crazy. All this knowledge, the Dharma, you could say, um, back in the day, thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, was very secret, sacred knowledge that was kept in secret societies, very small amount of people. And you'd be very, very lucky to be um, in the presence of a realized being or the knowledge of a realized being in your life. And the fact that we have it with us at all times is crazy to me. It's wild to me. And I think that's why it kind of goes over people's head because it's like too easy. Like if it was a secret society thing where it was kept and you had the, you know, only a select amount of people had it, you probably revere the teachings more because it's like, oh, okay, this, there's a reason. There's gotta be a reason why this is so secret. It must be something special. But the fact that it's out in the open, it, it i'm speaking personally it, for a few years of my life it went over my head like it didn't really it didn't really seem any different from many other teachings but when you really do dive into it and have faith and trust in these guys and yes. take that and translate it into your own life and your being it's like oh this is sacred knowledge this is truly sacred like there's something there's something here so the first time i don't know remember the first time but the first few times that i got into dharmic teachings from monks and sages and swamis of the past i was like there's something different about this it's different than a course in philosophy you know it's different than any other yes. teaching that i've ever heard i'm like there's they're using all the same words they're using the english language but it's how they use it and the conviction and how they use it and i'm like there's something different about this and i just followed that i followed that inkling in myself to go with that like i don't know what it is just something there's a spark in me that i just followed in the dharma and that leads the way i guess to anyone listening i would say just follow that spark that leads the way like uh it's sort of intuitive you know like i can tell whether it's i listen to a dharma talk or i read something from a book when something's real or not you know like i know for a fact there's something that just goes off in me i'm like oh yeah this this is coming from a realized place you know what i mean I know what you mean. Is there intuitive discernment that comes about in your search for uh, knowledge and wisdom? A hundred percent. They they say you're finding the guru, but it's truly the guru finds you. The God sends <laughs> yeah. you the guru. That's I, I think that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. And it's interesting too, right? We live in a, a time where, like I said before, we have this in our fingertips when before you actually had to have a personalized guru. Like I think before the internet, it was very important to have that transmission in the form of somebody who was realized and they got the transmission from someone that was realized and it was like a chain link of dharma that flowed through people but something happened something switched in the age of aquarius you could say where that we're in where it's like you don't need a guru anymore i can see why it would be worthy definitely to some people but i i, I don't believe in order to be donned with this wisdom in your being and to integrate it into your life i don't believe you need an actual personified teacher in your life to guide you i think like you said if you have enough trust in faith in these people the guru will just guide you 
naturally and it, it won't be in a form it won't be in a human form you know it's interesting see that i think that's we, we might just we might disagree on that the okay. person on the personalized one i i because it's like sometimes we're learning from somebody but we don't even realize like they're they're our personal guru but we just we haven't acknowledged them as as it is yet you know like for like i so i had a bunch of sages that taught me a lot of stuff but Nisargadarts, Sri Nisargadarts Maharaj was the one who like led me to enlightenment. And even like I love Siddharmeshwar, like I read him every day. But Nisargadarts was like the one who, and I get what you're saying. Like there used to be like lineages where it's like yeah. oh, like it's like a like okay, this person learned from that person. It's like a mantra initiation. And I think that's actually what the West has missed out on is I think more of like a person, a guru they could go to who's already who they've acknowledged as realized. Okay, I like I because even uh. This one of Jean, Jean Dunn, I say she's just a, like, she sh translated a lot of Nisargadatta's books and she learned, she stayed at Ramana Maharshi's ashram, but then she ended up being enlightened by Nisargadatta. And it's like, that's the same thing that happened to me. It's like, I learned from Ramana, I learned from so many sages, but I was enlightened by Nisargadatta. And I think um, what we've missed in the West is somebody who, and I read I Am That the most, like I was reading I Am That, like, oh my, like basically all day. Like, so, and, and I, it's like, it makes it the process faster. Like, Mm. Say like Nisargadatta, he like he he took three years to get enlightened from uh, Siddhar Meshwar, and it's like the focus, like focusing your awareness on one teaching and like being devoted to it, and then like it just makes it easier. Like it makes your life like it takes so many roadblocks out the way. It's like the things you think you know, the guru will shut that down. Like I remember Siddhar Meshwar, he was like one of the things that was crucial for me is like don't worry if like one of the things he said is like don't worry if another aspirant goes astray free yourself from the concept of you. And it's like words like that, being able to go back to him and read it, his words over and over again. And like, like you said, like sometimes we miss these things and it's like, but when I like acknowledge him, okay, this is my guru. I was able to go back and read over and over again. And like this, and it's like, it makes it so much easier. It's almost like a cheat code. Yeah. Like, so there's like, a, like a lot of, I feel like a lot of people in the West, like we, like, I feel like the more gurus we have, the better it'll be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was only saying like actually in person. Um, oh, I revere gurus for sure. And I revere like not even like having a guru and not even actually having meeting them either. You know? No, um, yeah, I, I agree because I never met. Yeah, I, no, I, I see what you mean. I just wanted to like, I'm, like, I no, I see what you I see what you mean completely. Like, it's like, like we don't the Internet because we're talking about the Internet. So it allows us to like reach out to gurus without even like being in person. But I just want yeah. I really want to talk badly about like how the West has missed out on like, cause we, yeah, we, mm. no, I definitely know you were like revered gurus. I just wanted people to know, like mm -hmm. I was in the back of my head. Like I wanted people to re I really wanted to mention that. I think you're right too. The West is missing out on that. Like being able to have uh, a relationship, whether you know the person or not, just like being able to have a relationship of a teacher that you can reference with a question or a quandary. Uh, yeah, that's huge for sure. Um, because like you said, there might be, roadblocks or there might be stuff in us that um just unsure of you know on the path and if you have like somebody there to point it out to you in the physical or not that's so helpful for sure and i think you mentioned it it's more efficient or it's more yeah it's more efficient yeah it's more efficient in that way to have somebody it's interesting too because you can't get caught up in the guru too much in the guru complex because a, a true guru right um is supposed to bring you back to you. And that's the ironic thing about it is you can't idolize another person too much. Like a real guru, and I'll, I'll actually ask you this question, but I'll say my opinion on it. A true guru brings you back to you. Like a true teacher, every teaching I feel as though is a remembrance for you or a reminder for you to go back to you. And if it's not indirectly or directly, if the person is saying you need me in some way, then I say run the other way because that's not a true teaching. A true teacher probably doesn't even call himself a teacher. They could. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But I think, you know, I don't think Ramana Maharshi was out there saying I'm a teacher or anything. He was he was the teacher, the teaching. I mean, he was the teaching himself. I think a true guru, a true teacher is that like their whole life is the teaching in a way. Like you could look back at Jesus's life or Buddha's life and see the, the trials and tribulations and the stuff that we, they went through in their story as the teaching and i think that's another like layer of the guru is like their life becomes a story that becomes a thread of the dharma you know what i mean so it's not they, they also said wise stuff as well they gave good sermons but also in, intertwined in there is their life and how they dealt with mara or how they dealt 
you know, 40 days and 40 nights uh, of fasting and stuff like that. And uh, the lessons that come from their life is also the guru um, or potentially could be the guru. Um, but yeah, moral of the story is every good teaching brings you back to you. If it doesn't run the other way. Yes, because it's dangerous to get attached to the form of a, a guru because then it's like, what's the point? And mm -hmm. it's like, like you're saying, like a guru is going to be like honest. He's always going to lead you back to you. It's always about freedom. And we all like that. I love that story of uh, like how the the sage, um, I think it was Bodhi Rama. He was he said, I'm pointing to the moon. Like, don't get too focused on my finger. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and it's like that's the beauty of like a sage is like he's he, it's like you didn't even now you would have been looking on the ground for the truth. But he just said he's looking at the moon and now you don't even need his finger. You're just saying, oh, my thank you so much for showing me. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, my friend. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm now I'm going to go look for myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of, of the guru. It's like, and this, the, like the power of just, just list, listening is so powerful. Like, like, and you were saying a true guru, he doesn't try to be one because it's, it's just a word. I mean, it's, it's very powerful, we, but it's like, these people are indescribable. I'm not lowering the word by saying it means nothing, but it, it, it really does mean nothing. Like the word guru, it's like they're, because their, their impact is so much more powerful than just guru. So it's like, they're not thinking, oh, I'm going to try to be a guru or I'm going to try to be this and that yeah. because that's validation. <laughs> yeah. You want to be worshipped for what? what do you, why do you want to be worshipped or like appreciated <laughs> for it? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. No, <laughs> no. Hmm. Yeah, that's funny, man. Uh, what is, I mean, we kind of already went over, but what is the guru? Like if you could define what a guru is to somebody that doesn't know any better, how would you define that? A guru, a true guru is one who frees um, his disciples or devotees or aspirants. He doesn't listen to what society thinks of him. He goes his own way. He doesn't copy others past. He, mm. he, no matter what others perceive as right or wrong or mm. as unorthodox, he, you'll see that there's a trend of I, they started something new in some way. In a sense that not that they started like a new meditation, but they just went their own way no matter what. They didn't try to appear perfect. They don't try to appear saintly. They just are as they are. Because, you know, you can find holes in these people um, no matter how much you want to. But a true guru is not going to try to behave like a saint. He's just going to be as he is. Like Nesigadar to Maharaj, he smokes. Now, a person yeah. had approached him. And it's the it, two gurus, they don't worry about appearing like, oh, like I'm, I don't smoke or I don't do this or that. Like this person was like, oh, you seem to be attached to smoking. And he said, well, you seem to be attached to not smoking. <laughs> and it's like he doesn't care. Like he doesn't mm. care to appear like a sage. And it's like the, and a lot of people like I, they say like Arjuna, he, there was a story about how he wanted to run away to the mountains to become a monk when the war started with Krishna. And, you know, a lot of people, simple-minded people, they might think, oh, Arjuna is more moralistic than Krishna. Krishna wants to fight in the war. And the difference is, is that Krishna is aligned with truth while Arjuna has this idea of morality. And this is the difference between a true guru and somebody who is trying to appear saintly like a pope. Basically, they try to appear to ideas of uh, saintliness while uh, a guru doesn't care about that. He just cares about truth. So a guru, sometimes he can be violent, sometimes he can be nonviolent, whatever it will help reach uh, enlightenment. Like there's extreme stories. I will, people, I don't view this as an extreme. I, I mean, anything's necessary in the path, path of truth. But Ramakrishna, he couldn't get rid of the, like he was fixated on the form of, he said he was fixated on the form of the goddess, right? Which, you know, we use forms of goddess to remind ourselves of the one. But he wanted to find the formless, the truth, the final truth beyond all forms and then the guru when his guru that initiated him he like he poked him with a like a glass in his third eye and he was like focus on that and then ramakrishna was focusing on that point and then he he had some hadi an experience of of ecstasy or divine ecstasy bliss mm -hmm. so it's like this is the it's like you know some people might look at that like or there's another story of ramakrishna there was a local queen and he like he had slapped her and she, because she was thinking about, because a, a lot of gurus, they have psychic abilities. They can read minds. Yeah. So she was thinking about like money. She was focused on money and the wrong thing. So he like slapped her and her, and her guards wanted to like beat him, beat him up. But he was like, don't like, she was like, don't, don't. I was actually, I was thinking about it. Like he saved me, you know? Wow. So it's like, it, it's like, this is the love of the guru. Like his unorthodox ways. He doesn't adhere to society. He just does what he has to do to, to help free people. Mm -hmm. That's the guru. Yeah. I think an important part about that one point that you mentioned was that they follow their own path. Like the realized being there's only 
I was gonna say there's only one Buddha, but we're all Buddhas. I guess there's only one um Gautam Buddha. Yeah, there's only one Siddhartha Gautama. You know, there's only one Jesus, but they're all on the same wavelength of the guru, of the realized being, of realizing that they're God in their own form, in their own play. It's interesting, man. And I think that's true for all of us is we all have our own path, you know, our own wayward path to this Sadhguru within. And I think that's very important to be because you can't be fake holy. You know, you can't try to be like Jesus. I mean, you can learn stuff from these other realized beings and translate that into your own life for sure. But you can't, you can't try to be like them because that's just another idolization. Exactly. You miss out on yourself. Yeah, exactly. So I guess that's the, that's the play. That's the tricky part. It's like, how do you translate that into your own life, into your own karma, you know? And uh, I don't know. I guess that's just the dance here. I guess that's what the path is all about, you know? Let the goddess spin you how she likes, and you'll be your truly yourself. Is that your quote? Or is that some other quote? Oh, no, it's my, that's mine. I like it. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I said this before we recorded, but your ability to just reference stories uh, in the Dharma, in Dharmic teachings is very impressive, man. I think that's a gift of yours, so... Thank you so much. Them. I love the sages. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm so happy. Like that's all I want. That's all I want to do is spread this, the stories and spread the freedom and just give give back to the truth by yeah. spreading it. Wow. Yeah. Like you're get you're serving the truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir, like that. My life is dedicated yeah. to this the service. Like. Amen. To nothing that. means more. Do you think that's where um, in that obligation that we spoke about before? Do you think that's where the road leads is to servitude in one way or the other? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, especially like in this path, because like Osho said, I have to share my, and you were talking about it too. I, you have to share this bliss. You have to, it's like, it, it's not your choice. Like you have to, you have to serve others. And it's like the compassion, it, like, it's not even you. Cause you remember how painful it was. Like, you know, cause you laugh at it. Cause you know, it was a game in your mind, but you remember how like this foolish mind had you fooled. So mm. you have to spread the knowledge of freedom. You have to, because it's, Serving others too, it makes it like either you really teach yourself when you teach others too. Like when you're helping others, you are really helping yourself in some type of way. Like I love feeding the homeless because, and I'm, I'm, you know, these holy people, they wouldn't like to admit it. I feel good when I, I do something. I feel a spiritual, a spiritual pride when I feel, when I do something good, mm -hmm. you know, it's like having pride about the right things. You know, yeah. you like, you, you realize the pride is a joke. It's a game, but it's like, <laughs> It, it's a contradiction in a way, but it's true. It's like this mind is you like a lot of people get confused when you're killing the mind. The thoughts are still going to be there. You're just separate from them. You're not going to fool yourself and identify with them. But thoughts are how you function, literally how you function in reality. Like it's yeah. like you just now you're just you, you you get rid of all the unnecessary stuff. It's like a filter. That's enlightenment is like the golden filter. Mm, the golden filter. That's good. Yeah, I like to Everything, say. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, yeah, every thought that goes through it is gold. But you, sorry, you were saying you, you like to say? Yeah, I like to say the difference is where the mind becomes a servant and you, this, the true self, are the master. When before realization, it was the other way around, where you yes. were the, you know, you were, you were the servant to the, the mind of the master of the mind. When that's not the case, that's that causes suffering. I mean, you can say the mind or ego. You know, ego. I guess is another way to say it. The ego becomes the servant because this yes. still happens. You know, the egotistical stuff still. I'm still Gary doing Gary stuff. <laughs> yeah, but, that's, you can't avoid that. Yeah. So all the talk about killing the ego, I guess in a certain way makes sense. But in you still have to play the game like the show still goes on, you know. But the show starts to change because the script is written a little bit differently, I feel, from that discernment. You know, like from um, from that changing of will, I guess you could say, when you do serve the one, I feel as though the ego, the show of the ego switches. And I think you referenced that. You already talked about that. And it's just towards servitude. Like it's just towards some kind of obligatory needed servitude. And um, yeah, it feels good. I I really think that's how you become happy in this life. If if we all want happiness, joy, or peace, bliss, whatever you want to call it, I think it just comes from loving other people in whatever way that you can. You you, you give back a little bit, and um, that's it. I think it's really that simple too. I think once you have the certain realization that you're God, 
you also start to realize that other people are God and uh, you start to serve that as well because that's how could I not? You know, they're just like another part of me and that's it. It's that simple, <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm so glad you brought I can hear the love in your voice too and it's like, I'm so glad you brought that up. And like Swami Vivekananda, I love this quote. Like he he said, like don't have pride when you're helping, like when you're helping a poor man. It's worship for you, not the cause of pride. And it's funny, even to have, even to say that it's worship is pride in a way. You can't really escape it. But mm. he's it's definitely better to be prideful about, you know, that oh I helped God than oh I'm I'm looking down on somebody and helping them. And that's why I love that quote. I see. Yeah, I helped God. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, I think it's really that simple. Um, and we all do it in our own way, like we said. We're all our own Buddha. And in that, we all tread the path of servitude in our own way. We all dance our own dance in our own way, you know? And that's what's cool. That's what makes life interesting, I feel. That's, if that's the beauty of it. It's like, even if you try to copy, you'll end up being ex unique. And it's like, that's why <laughs> Osho is one of, I call him the, the bougie Buddha. <laughs> because it's like Osho took a risk. Like mm. he like buying those Rolls Royces and stuff like that. It's like, well, he didn't care. To him, it's not taking a risk. He doesn't care. But it's like, mm -hmm. but he could be perceived the wrong way in a sense that, oh, this guy's enlightened, but he's buying all this material stuff. It could have destroyed everything. But it didn't because he's pure. It's pure. Mm, he's pure. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So would you say a realized being like the highest of the high, these saints that we read about? Where we listen to these people know that they're god at all times they wake up in the morning and know and they go to sleep and know so they're just, yes and they don't forget there's no forgetting or getting lost in the sauce like they know they're god always. yep it's 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 like before it's like before you thought this mask on the outside was you then you take the mask off you then you start touching it trying to really investigate wait a minute this mask doesn't feel right it like feels shifty like it doesn't like feel right on my face you take it off and you realize, oh, my God, I was nothing. <laughs> now you can't go back to putting the mask on. Yeah, you can't go back. There's Even no if you try back. to put it on again, it, it's yeah. like it doesn't work. Well, that's the thing is I feel as though, and speaking personally again as well, I feel as though we try to go back, you know, and that's the yeah, difference between a realized part. being in somebody that isn't quite there yet per se, is that the pull, especially in our world, in the Western world, the pull is always there and sometimes... Sometimes it gets me. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and I think like you can't get Ramana, Maharshi. You know what I mean? Like this is a, it doesn't matter how much pull there is. You're not going to get that guy or Nishigarta or, you know, any other Maharaji, any other sages out there. You're not going to get them. And I think that's the difference is like I I got the glimpse and I, I can fully tell you right now that we I am the infinite, eternal, always was and I always will be. But yet. I'm. I don't know. Like I still get, I still got karma to work through. You know, I still got stuff that I got to reap that I've sowed from maybe lifetimes past or in this life, who knows? And I think that's the difference between a true realized being and a not realized being is the, can you get them? <laughs> can you get them or not? <laughs> you know, can the mind, can the mind fool them? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really the only difference. And um, yeah, what would you say holds us back the most in that regard? Like, do you have any opinion on that? Like what, um, What's the greatest illusion or greatest way that the illusion tries to tempt us back into the mind state? The greatest way it tries to tempt you by, with the mind state is by thinking that you ever had it in the first place. You have to remember that you are already enlightened and that anything the mind does, it has nothing to at all. This is why devotion to the guru is important, because I would remember Nisikadarcha's words. Like one of my favorite quotes of his was, what difference does it make if the mind is busy or quiet? I am not the mind. Uh -huh. And remembering that it like every time the mind fools you, you just remember that quote, you sit in silence and you're like, oh, my God, I'm definitely not the mind. <laughs> yeah. And it's like this this experience of some hottie comes over you and you're like, OK, I got to practice this over. He, he told me to pay attention to the I am. I got to listen to this guy because look at this experience of bliss. I can't deny it. I've been skeptical my whole life. Everybody's lied to me. But look at this experience right here. I can't deny it. So I have to make it permanent. Mm -hmm. So you're saying doesn't matter if it's excruciating pain um uh pleasure that is ecstasy or anything in between it doesn't matter as long as you can be still and know what you really are and that comes from devotion to the dharma or the guru 
Exactly. And mm -hmm. one of the things that holds us back to is trying to be still. You, if, if Nirvana, one, one thing I love about Ramana, he, he says, if enlightenment was worth anything, it would be already there. And that's the thing. It's always there. It's mm -hmm. like you can't be because you you are God. You have to have like and this is why. Oh, I love. Oh, my God. I love this conversation. So <laughs> Star Messwork, he, he brought up how you have to have spiritual pride. Like Krishna was thinking of himself as a God and Tukaram was thinking of himself as a saint. So you have to be like, I am God. Like the mind doesn't have shit on me. Like, yeah. oh, yeah. Like you have to have like that fury. Like, I'm the, no, the mind, the mind can't bother me. What? Oh, the mind thinks the, all these intrusive thoughts. I don't care. Oh, my hope. Somebody died in my family. Well, they're God. It doesn't matter. This is an illusion. You have to like, you have to be loyal to the guru's wor like, word. And a lot of people think it's like a uh, cult in, in, indoctrination, but you have to put the guru before your family and not the form of the guru, but the words of what is he saying? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful stuff, man. Yeah, I can sense your devotion. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's all <laughs> encompassing. <laughs> <laughs> Are there, um, I mean, other than reading the guru's words or hearing their words as constant reminders, are there different paths in our lifestyle that you would recommend in order to be able to resonate with that, you know? That guru Feeding people and every time you feed or give a, somebody in need money, you think of them as God. Mm. Then you then you watch the pride when you you watch the pride about how you feel about giving it to that person. You take away all the neg the negative thoughts and you clean that out and you let the positive thoughts just be. You don't say I am a positive person, but you just you you pay attention more to the negative thoughts. I mean, the positive thoughts than the negative. And that'll naturally like clean your mind and make that the, a mind the useful tool. And then another thing, too, is I think a form looking to having a personal guru and then having a personal form of a goddess. Like I love, like one of my practices, right. Is I used to like, I, ha I used to have such a state, a dis an aversion to the world. Like I wasn't enlightened yet. So I had like a, like, Oh, I can't, which a sage can like not stand the world too, but it was, it's, an, it's, it's like, it was impacting my mind. Like it mm -hmm. wasn't like, Oh, I'm, I can't stand this world. I'm free of it. I don't even, it wasn't freedom. It was like, Oh, I'm frustrated. Like it's not going my way. I hate this world. So like, I basically that it freed me from like, like having a form of the goddess to say, okay, everybody is Kali. Everybody is love. Okay. Even if somebody betrays me, they're Kali. It's just the game of Kali. Having that reminder of like, okay, it's formless, but then also it gives you that love to have a form of the goddess. And I think lighting, like lighting an incense to the picture or doing puja, like doing an incense, like a lot of Hindus will do, and I'm not Hindu, but this is a beautiful practice to like, you know, be reminded of the form, the formless in the form. And it's basically you light incense to the goddess and just show appreciation. And then you do that same appreciation to other people, not just to the form of the goddess, but you have to remind whenever somebody harms you, remember, okay, it's just a form of the goddess, another form yeah. of the goddess. Easier said than done. Yeah, it's very easier. It's very, like, very easy to say than do it. That's why it took me three years to get it. <laughs> so you're saying um, have some sort of, reminder in your life that may be in a physical form whether it's like a picture or a painting or some kind of totem to bring you back to that as a reminder. yes yeah. constant reminders mm -hmm. even in great moments and bad moments people for they forget the sages in bad moments that's why you uh -huh. know it's like no no they, no they forget the sages in good moments it's just, so it's like when everything's going well like that i used to do that i used to i wasn't really truly devoted i whenever i had a romantic partner i was devoted to them uh, yeah. i was and that that messed me up every time. But when I started becoming devoted to the gurus, the romantic partners didn't disappear, but my pain definitely disappeared. Mm, yeah. Be because one of the things that Harmeshwar says is a true sign of realization is one basically he he's he's devoted to the uh, guru. The guru comes before any everything, and not the physical form of the guru, but in, in a sense, I'm mm. not going to let's say a girl that likes me, like like just now, like a girl like I'm talking to, like what's it called was a uh, text uh, just texted me right like i like before i would have been the back before enlightenment in my back of mind would be like oh i wish i was talking to her right now and i'm like honestly I i'd rather talk about wisdom all day and it's like she's probably gonna see this but i do not care like you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like i want to be honest uh, like <laughs> being honest so it's, it's like and this is the beauty of this is like when you're devoted to truth you you end up being truthful you know it's like before yeah. everything like you don't you don't care about losing anything in the material world it's like mm-hmm Yep. Like we said in the beginning, Dharma primary, girls secondary. Secondary, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's very true, man. Yeah, it's very true. She's just going to have to wait a little bit. 
No, a lot. Yeah, she can wait as, as long as, need, as, as needed. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, have constant reminders to bring you back in to know, you know, to have. I mean, there's also constant. There could be constant reminders. Well, I was going to say that's actually not the case. I was going to say there's constant reminders for us to fall off the wagon. But really, that is just Kali. That really it's, is just the goddess dancing. It's just um, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, how would you say that we were? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm kind of asking the same question, but no, this is good, great. You know, that's that's great. Like, it's you know, what I mean, like, how do we know? How do we know to be able to discern that even if somebody wrongs you, that that's Kali? Would you recommend incorporating meditation in your life so that when that does come about? that you your mind is still enough to be able to discern and see that even in the darkness is the light like what i guess that's kind of what i'm asking is like do you recommend anything in your lifestyle to be able to to see this cuz like i said easier said than done that's that's why meditation is important because you have to side cuz the mind is going to fight it's you can't understand this with the mind it's like an acceptance with your being so it's like when I'm saying Kali is somebody else, I'm not remembering it with the mind. I'm remembering it with my being. Yeah. So I'm refusing to listen to the mind because the mind is telling me all types of things. This person did this and that to you. Yes, they did. But they are also God. And who did they do it to? If there is no me, who did they do it to? And yeah. that's the power of self-inquiry. Mm -hmm. And Anomaly Swami, he taught a, a student of Ramana Maharshi who became a sage himself. He talked about it, that self-inquiry is not a, a, a part-time activity. It's a 24-7 activity. Mm -hmm. So... I've done people have done like basically like but like betrayal, like things that betrayed me. I mean, you know, stuff that, you know, would make my probably make people go crazy. And people they, they want it with Kali. This is why I love Kali, because she's a great form to focus on, because there was a story about Ramakrishna told this story about how she saw he had a, a vision of Kali and she gave birth to a baby and she was caressing it, taking care of it. And then she devoured it. Mm. And that's life. It's like the good and bad is both. So it's like, this is a true devotee is he doesn't just love God when he does good to him. He loves God when he does bad, because who am I? I I'm a nobody. He can't. God is not harming me. He's harming himself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus was able to love people still, because he knows it's just the, the fool's game. He's, he's God killing God. What it is. That's, there's no yeah. personal stuff in this. Forgive him. They don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. That's powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's why the, the cross, the symbol of the cross is so poignant. It's what it stands for. It's like true sacrifice. It's true forgiveness in the eyes of your enemy. He forgave all of his enemies as he was getting nailed to the post. Forgive him. They don't know. They have no idea what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they definitely didn't. It's crazy. So, yeah, I guess, you, like we said before, translate that into your own life, in our own crucifixions of our life. You know, forgive everybody because they don't know if anybody does wrong you. You know, there is no one to wrong, but if that is how the mind decides to decipher it. Um, I guess the true sage approaches it with forgiveness. Forgiveness, because it really is out of ignorance. Any wrong doing is out of true ignorance to what one is. And yeah, you can't, I guess that's what comes about from this is from realization is to not be reactionary toward any sort of malicious uh, intent of another is it's really to be more um, responsive in a wise manner that doesn't create bad karma for the world. And I think that's really what this whole thing's about. It's like you don't continue the cycle of samsara in that way of creating more and more karma. Like you don't react and continue on the, that, that wavelength of negative energy, you could say and you sort of diffuse it with forgiveness and i think that's really what this whole path comes down to and that's how we create a better world it's just through and it's just natural too that's the thing it's just natural discernment that comes about that, that comes about with that um you know what i mean i don't i think i know exactly what you mean because it's like once you accept the mind once you're beyond the mind because the mind is the only thing that can bring you into the negativity of the world mm -hmm. because the mind's going to function how it is anyway you're going to do what you're going to do no matter what so it's like accepting the mind, it just frees you from the game. It takes you out of the game. Like the mind is what brings you into it and going beyond the mind is what takes you out of it. Mm -hmm. Like Sage Niskadarja says, you can think as much as you want. Just don't think you're the mind. <laughs> and that's, that's just <laughs> funny. It's, yeah, it's, I, I love Niskadarja, he's amazing. And it's like, 
and basically he's saying that like you're not the mind so it's like how can somebody really harm you they can only harm the mind they can only harm the body and you're neither so who like there's no problem there's no there's like no problem yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there's no problem and then from that no problem this is no forgiveness forgiveness yeah well there is yeah there's forgiveness right yeah that's yeah exactly and um from that uh just a less suffering a more conducive lifestyle to peace essentially and this the beauty of this too is like even if you and it's like i it's not it's not about being a hypocrite like oh i'm gonna force myself to forgive this person they killed my whole family no it's about like just letting things because even Ch sri chanya mahaprabhu when somebody harmed his student he wanted to kill the person and he was a sage so it's not it's about having peace of mind while, but you still acknowledge what was done to you 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 forgive but you don't forget it's, you forget for your peace of mind you know Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people think spirituality is just about, it's all about being the saintly like figure where it's like, but as Sid Harmeswar said, you become a saint for yourself, not for others. And mm -hmm. then you'll automatically help others. Mm -hmm. Cause like way. we were talking about, like we were talking about before, it's like when you're focused on become, trying to become saintly, it's like you miss out because it's like, you don't actually help. You're just trying to be it's sick for your own ego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah, man. I feel that. Now, we've probably referenced this already as well. You feel this is uh, the only way out of suffering, essentially? This 100%. Is yeah. Because uh, the mind is the only thing that can cause suffering. So what better than to go beyond it and realize you're God? <laughs> exactly. I understand that. Now, how could we... How could we explain that maybe again to somebody that has no idea what we're talking about that following the path having devotion to the guru realizing your infinite connected nature to the cosmos and everything that is and isn't how would you say that is peace how does that bring you peace or happiness joy? so so those people who don't know what we're talking about I, I think they'll they'll definitely know this. They've been devoted to a lot of things. They've been devoted to romantic partnership, but that doesn't last. And even uh, if when they get that partner, they're thinking about them all the time and that person can die. Mm -hmm. But the gurus, they're either dead or they tell you all the time, don't get too attached to my form because we're all going to die. They, all, mm -hmm. they always remind you. So when you're devoted to the guru, when your senses are focused on the guru, it, they help you go beyond the senses. But when your senses are focused on Maya, now you get wrapped up in Maya and mm -hmm. the worldly illusion. And Maya is just basically anything that doesn't last, anything that doesn't yeah. satisfy you. Mm -hmm. But the, the important, the reason the gurus lead you to an eternal peace is that wisdom is always going to free you. It's water. Wisdom is like water. It's fluid and it's free. So it's always going to free you. That's why, you know, you can learn from so many different sages and stuff like that, because wisdom is so fluid. It's like it doesn't just have one way, but it all leads to the way. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. So essentially, we're all devoted to something, whether we know it or not. Yes. Yeah. It's about using that focus of your using the power of your awareness mm -hmm. to reach enlightenment. Yeah. And that um, devoting to God rather than devoting to money materialism the world the difference is that when you devote to god that's that's eternal you're devoting to something that never goes away when you devote to something that is of the material world eventually it's gonna pass away and exactly you know buddhism 101 when you devote yourself to something that passes away it's going to cause suffering but if you devote yourself to the dharma you're saying that it's never going to go away so what other way is there to find peace yeah exactly yeah man it makes a lot of sense and the beauty of it too is that the the more you the less you care the more things go your way in a sense it's like the more you, it's, it's because that mm. zero energy once you're along with the zero then everything is like like you're more you're it's like you're not you're it's you're not separate from the outside or external energy but it's like you're one with it so things just happen to like they like krishna says one who is aligned with me gets all of his, his needs met. Mm. And basically it's like when you're aligned with the path, the path makes its way for you. And that's mm. the beauty of it. It's mm. like Siddhar Meswar said, Lakshmi is the slave to the one who does not care for her and makes a beggar of the one who runs after her. Oh, and wow. yeah. I, yeah, I know, right? That's like, I, it's like, oh my God. I remember that too, the day I died, that quote, like that is. Yeah. 
Damn, man. That's good. Yeah, I was good. Like, Sadar Meshwar was so talented. Like, in <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you love these guys, man. I, I yeah, really, I, like, I, I sense so something in you that I have never sensed before in another person. And I mean that. I'm not just saying that here because I'm trying to pump you up or something. I sense something in you. I've talked to a lot of people that you have a real sense of devotion to the Dharma and, and I cherish that in you and I cherish having this conversation with you. And I, I mean that, man. So keep on doing your thing. I'm not wrapping up the conversation. I'm just saying, keep on doing your thing. And uh, I think, I don't know, man. I think you got a bright future. Or you had a bright present, but I, I, I think you also have a bright future as well ahead of you in this whole thing. Because the, the, your, your love and your presence and your spirit altogether, whatever you want to call it, I could sense it through time and space on this video call that it's real. It's real for you. So um, just keep doing your thing, man. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, but I appreciate you. The, the real knows real is <laughs> real like, recognize real. <laughs> by, by, because vibrations are powerful. It really like real knows. Real. It's like you send that energy, like energy, people under energy is underrated. Like it's, and mm. I, I'm glad you recognize it's like, the pure, the purity that's in you is in me, and it's like there's a lot of fake people out there that like they're so like a lot of spiritual, a lot of especially spiritual teachers in the West, and like like you said, I'm I'm different, different than other people in a sense that these people they're not like there's a lot of spiritual teachers too I see that they use a lot of like like co like coercive and like business like methods to get mm. people their message across and like a lot like I just, I'm not gonna make this a gender thing, but I even notice like a lot of like western spiritual teachers women spiritual teachers in the west they use like kind of like seductive methods oh, to man. like bring you in notice that too oh yeah oh, like yeah. it's like to bring uh, in and i'm like it's kind of sad like i see it all the time too man yeah yeah it's like it's really sad and it's like they give no credit like you give credit to the sages you interview monks you give credit to the sages you know and it's like but they don't want to like they want to like make it their own thing and it's like yeah. that's not that's horrible no that's dark energy that's some dark yeah. magic right there you know, literally, and it won't, yeah. it'll lead you in a loop. It'll have you in a loop watching, you know? Mm, yeah, I've noticed that too, man. I'm glad you brought that up, and I can't believe we're talking about it right now, but I believe a lot of people, not mentioning any names, but I believe a lot of people are only very popular because they're physically attractive. I'm just going to say. Yes. <laughs> yes. So they just get views, and it works. That's the thing, is it works. It gets views, and it gets people watching their videos, mainly guys, because they're just attractive in the thumbnail it's as simple you know, as that. literally <laughs> <laughs> oh i hate to say it but that's the truth man and a lot of them some of them they got you know honestly i'm gonna i'll admit some of them do have good stuff to say and they are wise and it works but a lot of a lot of it no it's just for clout I and mean, it's just to get views unfortunately and they use buzzwords spiritual buzzwords and parrot other people to get the views and like i said it works and it's unfortunate but that's just the times that we're in no, yeah, the illusion, you know, that's a, the illusion has that that a way of doing that. It's like, you know, there's so many illusions. Even sp it leaks into spirituality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I don't know, man. Shifty, it's shifty. I'm trying to think where we can go from here. But yeah, that's. Oh man, I'm so glad you brought that up. I'm so glad you know that too. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think where we can go from here, man. I don't know. Do you have any threads <laughs> off of that we can go down? Oh, uh, I get, I, oh, yeah, actually, I want to talk more about how, like, because I, I would really want to emphasize, like, devotion, like, yeah. and, like, how people have missed out on that, like, mm. it's, like, I feel like the not enough credit has been given to this, like, the sages in the past in the West, like, I've, it's, it's kind of, like, bothering me a little bit, how, like, I just feel like, a, like, there needs to just be more acknowledgement, acknowledgement of other teachers, like, I just don't, I just don't like how credit has not been given to, like, like this, this new wave of spirituality, mm. it's not giving credit to India. It's not giving yeah. credit to the Eastern side of things. Like it's not, it's not giving credit to Asia. It's not giving, it, it's really like bothering. It's bothering me. Like it's. Man, this is another thing that I thought of before. I'm so glad you brought this up, but we're, we're on the same wavelength. I feel as though there's a lot Definitely. of spiritual teachers out there in the neo Advaita scene that are skipping that. Like they're skipping over, over the Dharma um, of India and it's like it's a missing link like you need to approach these teachers i feel like they're just yeah there's just something missing i don't know how to describe it but i think just like you said they don't give enough credence and maybe they just haven't given the time to really where all of these teachings 
mainly I'm referencing Neo Advaita, where it all came from. And that's India. That's the East. All of this came from the East thousands of years ago from people that just meditated and that's it. They didn't have the internet. And these teachings have lasted over the years in a game of telephone, sort of, <laughs> over the years for it's us. Way describing it. Yeah. And uh, if you're not exposed to that and you try teaching, it can be valuable. It's an honorable pursuit in a way, but I think you're just skipping over. You're skipping some kind of link, man. You're skipping the link of Dharma because that's how I see Dharma in a way. It's like a link, a transmission from person to person. And if you're not referencing the the OG material, there's just <clears throat> something doesn't compute. It doesn't hit, you know, it doesn't hit in the same way as if I were to read something from Nishragarta or Ramana or any other sage. It just, um, the, the, the resonance isn't there. You know what I mean? And I think it's just because the transmission isn't there in the person, you know, and I'm not judging. I'm not, uh, that's, that's their path. That's fine. If it works, it works, but it doesn't resonate with me because I know it's not the, um, it's not the real, you know what I mean? It's not coming from, it's not coming from the, the OG, the like I said, the heart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what it is. It's not really coming from the heart. More so it's coming from the mind, which that could be some dark magic as well, too. It's like, guys, the, that's, what, that's what gets you caught in loops. Yeah, exactly. And the, yeah, and a lot of people I see get caught in that in the comment section. Like, I don't get it. This doesn't make any sense. And that's what it is, is the mind is trying to compute and it doesn't compute. And it's, it's never will compute. I mean, if you do approach it with the heart and the teacher approaches it with the heart, mainly, that's the first step then something computes, but not of the mind and of the heart. It's a deeper level of understanding and wisdom that comes through the word. And that is priceless, man. That That is uh, very important. So, yeah, do you have anything else on that note to say of why it's important to reference the East and the Masters in that way? Yeah, I, I do. It's like, I said, Hermeswar talked about it too. It's like, one who who has too much pride, he's puffed up with pride. He loses in the end. He loses. He's he's called overly wise. He doesn't feel like because these senses, like we said, whether we we know it or not, we are devoted to something. Even Nisargadatta Maharaj. Now he didn't need to do this, but it's just wise to do it. That he continued to do the stuff that his guru told him to do, singing devotional songs and stuff like that, to set an example to other people. Like his guru was like, well, you need to continue to do this stuff after enlightenment to set an example to other people. And he gave credit to his, he gave credit to Siddhar Meshwar and it also gives people an opportunity to get other perspectives. And it's like, okay, like, okay, you need one, you need to surrender yourself to one guru and learn one, uh, a method and go all the way. But also it gives you a new, another perspective where it's like, oh my God, there's so many different paths. Like, like there's so many different ways. Like the, you learn about the Avadutas who they completely renounce the world. And you have the bougie Buddha Osho who has a bunch of Rolls, Rolls Royces, you know? So it's like, there's so many different paths I could do. I could renounce the world or I could, you know, have a, a million, billion dollars, you know? It's like, so it's important to see and to give credit because it also helps you because the more credit you give, the more I'm looking back, reading and benefiting off of this. Mm -hmm. So it's like the, the devotion to the guru only benefits you because he's nothing. He's only ref a reflection. He's leading you back to yourself, like you said. So mm -hmm. it's like acknowledging him and acknowledging them, it only helps you. And like you said, they help at a mind level. And you know, it's like, we're so godly that we can listen to a fraud. And because we can, like Ramana Maharshi says, you can meditate on a rock and it'll lead you to enlightenment. <laughs> so we're, we're so godly and the enlightenment is so already there that we can listen to a fraud and, and you know, it helps us, you know, with our mindsets and stuff like that. But leading us all the way, it, you know, that's yeah. the, the difference. Yeah, that's the big difference. It won't lead you all the way. It'll just be, and if it's not going to lead you all the way, I mean, I guess it's, what's the point? Is it just yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Um, exactly. I like to say in my talks, man, for anybody listening to this, uh, if I'm not leading you there, then just go reference all the the stuff that I talk about, all the gurus that I talk about, and they'll get you there. You know, they're yeah, way thing. higher <laughs> than me, right? You know what I mean? If If my service is just bringing light to the gurus, then... That's, I feel like that's an honorable job. You know what I mean? Definitely um, is. Yeah. You're neat. That's yeah. The Gene, Gene Dunn who, who spread his Nisgadarta's books in the West is just as important as Nisgadarta. That's yeah. like Nis, Nisgadarta says Maurice Friedman. He was a self, I love Maurice Friedman. He's just, he was a self-realized being. I wouldn't know Nisgadarta without him. Nisgadarta, he talked about how he used to have a quiet life before Maurice Friedman, who was, he was an <laughs> actor. 
uh-huh. and he's our director and he showed up to his house and before Maurice Friedman, Friedman, he had a quiet life. But then after Maurice Friedman, his life became like a train station. So these <laughs> people are needed. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, like, yeah, it's no, there's no higher and lower in this. It's just roles mm. that need get help people get to where they need to go. Yeah, very true, man. Very true. It may seem like there's higher because we're talking about these realized beings. But yeah, it all like the realized being just plays its part in us in a way, in whatever form that it comes about even if we're just referencing their name, you know, for somebody to maybe get the inkling to go check out their teachings, you know? Exactly. And it's like yeah. the inner guru, it, it won't work without the inner guru. Don't be scared of the guru because he can't, He nobody can trick you un- unless it's you. You are the one who makes yourself a slave to the guru. Not mm. He doesn't want you to be a slave to him. He wants to be by himself drinking his tea. He doesn't want you to. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make sure you, you make sure you awaken the inner guru. Yes, exactly. That's the most important part is awaken the inner guru, the sad guru. Well, let me ask you this one, man. Um, on the note of personified teachers that you reference, um, do you have like a list, top five that you could you could give for us to reference? Yeah. I'll put, so I'm gonna. So this this is not in any order, but this is like my top five that I think. So like I'll, I'll go. So I'll go like name by name that I think is important that will really like. What, what it destroys, I call it the Buddhist disease, where it's like you get caught up in right behavior or ideas of what behavior or enlightenment is. So this, these are people that like shatter your idea of what a sage is that will actually lead you to more enlightenment. Okay. So I, my, my big five. So I, Krishna, I think, is a very important because a lot of people, they become docile or they become ren- too much, too much renunciants. But the beauty of Krishna, I love Krishna. He was a politician and he, and he was a renunciate. So he was mm-hmm. a beggar. He he was he got taught under um, Sandi Pandi and he was a beggar. So he was a renunciate and he used to give his food away. Like when it, it was funny, like the story of Krishna, he would go out and beg and then give all his food away. And Sandi Pandi would be like, we have no food. Like, you know, because that was one of his like works as a brahmachari to go and beg. So or like one of the processes. And then but then also Krishna was a politician. Like he had he just said Krishna just had fun. So it's like. Mm. Krishna is an important guru to learn from and reading the Bhagavad Gita and just seeing how Krishna, even he killed tyrants and stuff like that. And a lot of people, you know, a nonviolent man who doesn't defend himself or others is a fool. It's like, and, and I'm going to, and I, I'm going to segue into Osho, how Osho also talked about how a nonviolent man is also against violence against himself. And a lot mm. of people, violence, poverty is violence against yourself. So now, if, if your destiny is to renunciate, no, ma- no matter what, that's your path. Nobody, God, you know, God, nobody can stop God when he's going his way. But people, they try to unnaturally renunciate and that turns into masochism. Oh, and it's yeah. like forcing it is not the way. When you know, you like you were talking about that inner knowing before. When you know, you know. So it's like, it's like, like, that, ma- like that masochist way of renunciation is not the way. It's like the, the sadhus, they renunciate to get to enlightenment. They don't try to like run away from it. It's like, it's, it's it's almost impossible to put into words. You you have to go beyond thought to understand why renunciation and 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 you know being in the world is not your choice. And, you know I, I can't you can't put the truth into words. It's a, you, I yeah. can't. Mm-hmm. But it's like the reason Osho is so powerful is because he teaches you that you don't have to and that you don't have to starve yourself. You don't have to be renunciate to be in lane. You can and Krishna teaches that too. You can play in the world. And then I get to Nisargadatta Maharaj where. This is why my main emphasis is getting beyond behavior, because when you get beyond behavior or ideas of what you think you should be, you end up finding who you are. So mm-hmm. that's why I give these five. It's like the, he was at, I, told, I told you about this before. Somebody asked Mr. Gadar to, oh, you seem you seem to be attached to smoking. And he seen he said, you seem to be attached to not smoking. Mm-hmm. This is the power of not being having aversion to things. It's accepting yeah. things. Yeah. You know, it's it's like the and then like he teaches you that, like, you don't have to, like, not have i guess pleasure or experience it's like everything is pleasure you know so it's yeah. like it's about being not attached to it it's being free and then another i think another great reference when we were talking about this before is not trying to be anything ramana maharshi ramana he was he just went to his cave arantula and he was just chilling vibing he's he just you know somebody asked him a couple hey oh why are you so calm why you know why are you so blissful and then everything happened after that like you were mm. t- talking about before so it's like don't try to become anything just be and you'll end up being what you are mm. mm-hmm. and then i so i talk, so that's the four and then uh the one i'll talk about and it's like he's a he's actually an unknown i love this thank you so much for this conversation brother i just i love <laughs> talking you. about this stuff of course it's, it's uh so you know sage kabir Kabir, that sounds familiar. Yeah, um, Kabir, isn't he a poet? 
Oh uh, yeah, he's a po- yeah, he's a poet, mm-hmm. divine mm-hmm. poet. So mm-hmm. his son Kamal actually, this is a this is a great story. So his Kamal Kamal is very underrated. Basically, Kabir was very traditional, so he refused to take money. He refused to you know do this and that. But Kamal and he teaches people. This is why you have to kill. This is what I want to get this point across too. While we have to be devoted to the guru, we also have to kill the guru. But basically, we and you know we we can't let the guru just because he follows this certain way of behavior. That doesn't mean we have to follow that certain way of behavior. So Kamal would have would take money. Like he would allow he would take money. And there's a story of Kamal. Um, Sid Harmeshwar told this story. He said how. Kamal saw a diamond, but thought it to only be hard and shit. <laughs> so mm. he didn't see a problem with taking money. It wasn't even worth like it wasn't worth anything to him. Like so, it's like Kabir had his way of not of not being attached to money, and Kamal had his way. It's like he didn't see a problem with taking it, and Kamal and Kabir didn't see a reason to take it. And that's why I wanted to use Kamal as my fifth and final example that I think is important that I want to use because I can literally go on all day about like a, so many sages that like I can make a whole list all day. But mm-hmm. I want to use these five as emphasis to like. Kamal basically frees you from the illusion of aversion, basically like, oh, I need to avoid this. I need to be this type of way to be enlightened. Just be as you are. And, he, yeah. and he, his father, the reason I think it's so important, his father was a renowned sage at the time. So for him to rebel against his father, you know how the father is very that nagging voice in your head or the parents that they really force you. So imagine, you, you know, like Sid Harmesh were talking about how the parents really bring you into body consciousness the most. They really put fear in you the most. So it's like, imagine like, Imagine this guy has a sage father and he's rebelling. Like that is that is powerful. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like we talked about before, man. Um, it goes beyond their actual lessons. Sometimes it's in their actual life, like the self-realized beings. The lesson is in their lifestyle or the things that happen and how they respond to the things that happen to them. So that right there, man. Yeah, that's why I love the stories. Yeah, the stories. Yeah, the stories, man. That's the thing is um, now that I am on this wavelength, I understand the story of Jesus a lot more. Like I get it now and I'm sort of Christian in a way when before it didn't make any sense. But now I approach it differently and I see really what Jesus was saying in his story. And it all makes sense, man. Like when you put the whole context of the story together and what it really means and what it means for you. That's when, um, that's when the teaching is true. Is you can translate whatever the lesson was, whatever the story was, into your story. And uh, yeah, any sage is like that, man. I think any true sage is like that. It's like something in their story that you can translate and that resonates. I think that's um, what makes a sage a sage or a saint. A saint is just something in their story that you can use for your own story. That's the thing is you... That we're living a story right now. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, <laughs> this is a story, man. You know, um, and that's the beauty of it too. I real, I think you know, once you kind of, uh, it's gonna sound pompous to say, but I don't really care. It's like once you like good <laughs> understand the Dharma in a way, you become the Dharma. Like you, the, the Dharma transforms like into you. You you become part of the story, just as all of these saints have their stories, and they had they probably had their saints and their teachers too that had their own stories. But now it's like we are the saints of the future. And like I said, that sounds so pompous. I hope I'm not coming across that way, man. I don't know. I'm not. I don't want to. I wish I could take that back. I don't want to say I'm a saint. But in other way, we're all saints. (laughs) You know what I mean? We're all we're all part of the Dharma in a way. You know, we're all sages. So it's up for all of us to take the stories of the past and translate into our own sainthood. And uh, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's, de- that's definitely not pompous because there, Sid Harmesh will talk about it too. Is I love this quote is how Krishna was thinking of himself as a god, and spiritual pride pride is necessary. It's not really pride, but you, words to just describe it. It's like the, the only re- way you would be uh, think scared to, or somebody would be scared to declare that they're a saint is that if they thought that if they think they're a saint now, somebody else is lower. But when you truly believe that everybody be- can become a saint, you have no problem with saying that you are one. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to look at it, man. Oh, that's good. Yeah. We're all God. So, so yeah. So what's the, we can call ourselves anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. You're so wise. So wise. Thank you, brother. You too. This is great. Um, Yeah, this is an awesome talk, man. I don't know how long we've been talking, but this is this is great. I'm glad I met you. I'm glad the YouTube algorithm recommend me your videos. 
Destiny, um, how it works. <laughs> destiny, man. Yeah, the algorithm has become destiny. That's how I find all my people. All over 200 people, most of them have been from the algorithm. Some suggestions, some people have gotten in touch with me. Most of them, it's just like I go on the internet at the right time and I see the, the thumbnail and the, and the title, check the person out. I'm like, oh, yep, here we go. And then I'm in a Zoom call. <laughs> That's amazing. Crazy. Yeah, the internet has led to uh, led to some very uh, is it serendipitous uh, acts of creativity and acts of the Dharma being able to be transmitted and transformed and uh, yeah, just cool stuff, just fun stuff, you know. <laughs> Shout well, out the I internet. I like that word, serendipitous. Mm, serendipitous, man. Oh yeah, I was. I just thought I was gonna. I think um, just an idea, just throwing it out there. Since you revere the sages and you have a lot of knowledge on their life and their lessons, maybe for future content for you would be to make specific videos based upon sages and why they're important to you. You know, I know you reference them all in your talks and you're kind of just like spontaneous in the way. But if you were like this, I mean, you don't have to listen to me, man. But if you were to like tackle these sages for like specific, like their life, I would enjoy that. Like if I would enjoy watching videos of you tackle, um, just like uh, whoever could be your son was, I already forgot his name and why that was important to you and what their, the lessons were in their life, you know? So just throwing that out there. Thank you. That's funny. I was going to actually make a video on like, um, like I'm just trying to figure out how to title it, but mm -hmm. like non aversion or like non attachment to like, like basically getting rid of the Buddhist disease, like not behaving, like killing the, yeah, I might title like killing the master or something. Ooh, killing like, the what? master. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah something, and then, but, but also like loving the master at the same time. Like, yeah, that's the message you'd have to get across is killing the master is actually loving the master at the same time. And the thumbnail is like you're stabbing Buddha or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, I yeah, so, yeah. It's like, but then he's all, like, also like love hugging him around or something. Something like that. Yeah, I don't know. But I like that. Killing the master. I think that is, I talked this, I talked about this with um, Bonte Joe and he said the last step of an arhat is letting go of the Dharma. And I think that's pretty much what you're referencing is killing the Buddha or letting go of the Buddha. The last step is letting go of the teachings. And uh, I can see that. And that's a sort of irony and a sort of joke in that, right? I find it's like, you know, we put so much reverence into the Dharma, always will into these sages and the teachings. But at the end, if you want to call it the end, is a sort of just being like, what? why did I care so much in the first place? Like, what did I like? It's like, yeah. what did I do all this for in the first place? I was always God. What did I have to learn? It's this sort of irony and joke in that I find, you know, it's like, why? Why did I even have to? Um, but I feel that. I feel that. And it's not like, it's not like you're f forgetting the reverence, you know, I will always have reverence and um, honor the teachers. But I find now that I don't really, I don't really reference them as much as I used to back in the early days when I started this path, you know, like I don't, I don't need to read the Upanishads or any kind of Dharma like I needed to every night, you know, it's sort of like less attachment to the Dharma. I think that's the last attachment is to spirituality. <laughs> yes. Know? The last attachment is um, the letting go of the attachment of being unattached. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's, it's say, did that make say, sense did that did that make sense that last point no yeah that made a lot i'm okay. so happy you said that because that <laughs> okay. made a lot of sense like <laughs> say, on this regard he says he, he's a sage and he said i'm not spiritual like mm. I, spirit, spiritual uh, spirituality is as discardable as dishwater i am nothing and even nothing has no meaning yeah <laughs> like yeah. that's freedom that's, and that's freedom. a sage saying that Imagine yeah. a sage saying he's not spiritual. Like what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, it may, I it makes sense to me, but like, say I first like before I was on this wavelength, read that as my first quote ever getting to spirituality. I think like, what? What do you? What do you mean? You're not <laughs> spiritual. You look spiritual. You were in the robe. You're you a got sage. The, what? Like, you're a sage. You got the name. You sound spiritual. I get it though. I totally get but, it. I'm glad you said that makes no sense too, because Osho says to learn from me, you need to have some uncommon sense, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. of the Zen mm -hmm. mind going beyond what you think, you know, yeah, or I get what it, you man. know, I get it, man. Yeah. Wow. It's the middle way. You can't be too, you can't be too fake. Holy. You can't fake it. Um, you can't be too hedonist either. <laughs> I feel yes. like. it's somewhere in between there for whatever our path is. It's hard to say. It's hard to generalize, but, 
you tread the middle way between those two poles of the renunciate and the complete hedonist. And I think somewhere in between there, you'll find yourself. Or who knows? You might be a complete renouncer. Very rare, I feel as though. And you might be a complete hedonist. That's also very rare. <laughs> yes. It's- who knows? Who knows? But most of us are somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, I feel. It's best to be. And, it's, yeah. and as long as you're in the middle inside, you know? Mm, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. That's That's really what it's about. Yeah. That was just a figure of speech I was using, but really it's you know, inside. No, yeah, you know, you, yeah, you were yeah, saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah, man. Shit. This is good. Um, yeah, this was amazing. <laughs> this is amazing, man. I don't really know where to go from here. Um, that's, that's the universe telling us to be quiet. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, that's the thing is I do these talks, right? I get to a certain point with people. I'm like, all right, what more do I have to say? You know, there's only so much we can say. And then it just becomes redundant at the end of the day. Devotion to the guru, um, the sa- in within, the guru is within. Don't mistake the finger pointing at the moon for the moon. And that's it. Continually go within and uh, that will lead the way. I guess that's what I would recommend and share with everybody is to continually go within. Meditate as much as you can and then eventually... Life just becomes meditation. Life becomes the sadhana itself. And uh That's a bar. Yeah. Life becomes the sadhana. That's a bar. That's that's what I think. I don't know. That's what you know for sure. That's what I know. <laughs> <laughs> Life is the sadhana, man. It is. It's like uh we do we do have a practice and I, I still do meditate, but at the end of the day, when I open my eyes in the morning, that is the practice. And when I close them the practice and even in my dreams that is the practice so yeah man. always on the way always on the way always the student yeah that's another thing too is like people call me people have called me guru people have called me uh, you know a teacher but i always i i to remain a devotee is the true mm. is the true uh, privilege because it's like to to always be to always be in the state of not knowing and to yeah. always not know is freedom yeah it really is man yeah oh yeah even teachers are students. Even teachers are still learning as they're teaching. And they always give credit to the, the their teachers. That's it. They always remain a devotee. Like Sid Harmeshwar, yeah. even he would he would always talk about Baseb uh, Maharaj, his teacher. He would always say like, you know, he would always reference him. But then his like, it's like even if you're t- referencing the old, your own way comes out. So it's like you don't. That's why they say don't try to be a guru. Don't try to outcompete with the guru. Like he was trying to admit, let people know about his about the seven Maharaj. He wasn't trying to like mm-hmm. you know be popular. Mm-hmm. Like and then he just ended up becoming a guru himself. Like that's you can't try yeah. to become. <laughs> that's that's very true, man. Yeah. Wow. Okay, this is good. Yeah, this is amazing. This is good, man. Um. Well. Do you have any last words? I think we could probably start to wrap this up. Last words for the pod. Anything you want to get off your chest? Uh, one thing I would just say to people is just know that whether the mind is busy or it's not, you are not it. Just re- please mm. remember that. Mm. You're always free. Please remember that you are enlightened before you did anything. And you're mm. enlightened after you do everything. All well said, man. I don't have anything else to say to that. We're always free. Always. Free. Always. Always are and always will be. That's it. Um, I thank you for coming on here, man. Um, thank you for having me, brother. Thing. Of course. Of course. My God, brother. Thank you. Keep up the good work. I wish you all the best. And um, I think we should definitely talk again in the future. I feel like we just touched the tip of the iceberg. But we got some good flow here. And I like your personality and energy. But please keep doing your thing in the meantime. Keep up the great work. And um, that's it. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for existing. And thank you for existing as well. And thank <laughs> you. For listening, anybody in the future, um, we're always free. That's always, it. always, and forever, we're free, man. Um, peace and love, peace and love to you, peace and love to anybody that listened. See ya.